Greeting everybody. Greeting everybody. So, in spite of um, we uh, understanding about uh, the harms of, in spite of we understanding the harms of conventional ventilation and uh, the usefulness of non-invasive ventilation. I think all the NICUs have ventilators. We cannot go away with the fact that invasive ventilation is a part and parcel of NICU care. And to learn about this, and we would want to have as minimal ventilator-induced lung injury as possible. So to learn about all these things, about how to optimize the ventilation and how to define the lung protective strategies. We, we have an excellent talk today by Dr. Pesler. Uh, he is from Czech Republic and he has graduated. Uh, can I have this? Uh, in, Introduction. Yeah. Uh, he has uh, done his, he's uh, graduated from McGill University, Montreal. He is the professor of pediatrics in Brown University and uh, also the director of uh, respiratory uh, services at the Women's and Infant Ho Hospital of Rhode Island. He's a seasoned clinical trialist who led several multi center. Uh, randomized clinical trials of various modes of respiratory support that have importantly impacted the clinical practice. He is also one of the investigators of the NIH-funded neonatal research network, and he is also a very active educator, author, and ed editor, including the just released seventh edition of Assisted Ventilation of Neonate. He's on the board of the directors of the Hippocrates Found Foundation and is responsible for these respiratory seminars. His, his areas of research in, interest include the volume targeted ventilation, the delivery room stabilization, high frequency ventilation, pulmonary hypertension, BPD, ECMO, and PNO. Now, may I request him to start his talk? So thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, and uh, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, share with you in uh, a very short period of time uh, uh, some key concepts about uh, how to avoid lung injury as best as we can. And as you heard, um, we can't always do that, but we try. So uh, let's see if we can, uh, I, I'm assuming everybody can see my slides, okay? Yeah. Yes, very good. Uh, so I want to begin with the key concept, which is that ventilators are nothing more than tools in our hands. And um, while uh, the manufacturers have come up with some very sophisticated devices, uh, they're not, the machines themselves are not inherently lung protective. No matter how good the tool in our hands is, if I do not use that tool the right way, if I do use, if I use it for the wrong job, the result will not be as good as it could be. So we need to understand what we're trying to achieve. We need to understand the pathophysiology and we need to focus on our individual patient because they're not all the same. Uh, so the other concept that's important is that BPD, the ultimate pulmonary outcome uh, is affected by a whole host of uh, factors. Uh, pathogenesis is very multifactorial and of course, uh, Injury to the lungs may begin already in utero with inflammatory um, problems related to chorionionitis, uh, growth restriction and oligohydramnios cause the lung to be hypoplastic at the moment of birth and more susceptible to injury. 
preterm delivery uh, and the initiation of air breathing are critical time where lung injury can occur very rapidly. And as I said, there are all these other factors that play a role. We don't have time to cover all of them, but the key message here is that lung pre prevention of lung injury really has to be a package deal. It has to be a bundle of interventions uh, to try to minimize um, uh, the bad outcomes. So our preterm infants are at a disadvantage uh, at the moment of birth because of all these factors listed uh, at the top of this slide. Uh, preterm infants have excessively compliant chest wall, which lacks the rigidity to um, expand the lungs and keep them expanded. They have limited muscle strength and endurance. They often are born by cesarean in the absence of labor. So they have more fluid in their lungs to begin with. And they often have some respiratory depression. So they have a limited ability to establish and maintain functional residual capacity. And so we must do something to help them uh, achieve that important goal so they can effectively exchange gas. But it turns out that it is very easy to injure the lungs um, in the early moments after birth. And these are some very old data uh, from an animal experiment um, where uh, animals were exposed or not exposed to uh, six rather large tidal volume inflations uh, after uh, being uh, uh, given surfactant. And you can see that in the control animals that did not receive the injurious ventilation, there was a nice improvement in compliance as you would expect, but the animals were uh, uh, large tidal volumes caused capillary leak and acute uh, edema. Um, the surfactant effect was essentially uh, eliminated. So it is again, very easy to, uh, to incur damage uh, at, uh, in the first minutes of life. And that's why we talk about the golden first hour among other reasons. So because of the problems with insufficient chest wall rigidity uh, and use of positive pressure with end expiratory pressure or CPAP uh, uh, in spontaneously breathing babies is critical in facilitating the establishment of functional residual capacity. These are studies done a number of years ago with um, face contrast radiography uh, where air is white. And you can see that these animals that were ventilated uh, without PEEP, uh, there was really no FRC. There was no aeration at the lung, of the lungs at end exhalation and very little and rather uneven aeration after 20 positive pressure inflations, even at peak inspiration. Whereas with uh, some reasonable level of PEEP and five is probably not enough for most babies. Uh, there was a reasonable amount of air within the lungs um, at the end of exhalation and the lungs were nicely aerated, evenly uh, distributed after 20 inflation. So PEEP, um, if you're using positive pressure ventilation or CPAP in babies breathing spontaneously is critical uh, to establish adequate lung inflation, which I will talk about later, is critical in avoiding lung injury. <clears throat> there was a lot of interest in sustained inflation, uh, a process that exposes babies to a prolonged uh, inspiration, typically 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, the rationale being uh, that uh, fluid is more viscous than air and it takes longer inspiratory time to effectively move fluid through the small airways. There's a lot of interest in that in Europe, but um, the data were inconclusive. So Harish Kirpalani and I, as well as Peter Davis got together and uh, did this large randomized trial, uh, which is the last study here that was added to the updated meta-analysis. And clearly there is no particular benefit, certainly not in survival. In fact, um, the trend is away from sustained inflation and there was no benefit in terms of reduction in chronic lung disease. Uh, and therefore, uh, the sustained inflation enthusiasm has rapidly uh, faded. We, of course, know that the best way to avoid ventilator induced lung injury is to avoid mechanical ventilation and use non invasive techniques. I'm not going to focus on non invasive support because of lack of time. I think we all know they are effective in most of the uh, more mature babies, but the extremely preterm infants, less than 28 weeks, um, do not succeed as, as often, um, at least uh, in this study uh, from 2016 from Australia. Uh, 
Uh, the folks who do bubble CPAP really well would argue and, and seem to be able to demonstrate that they have good success with uh, non-invasive support down to as low as 26 weeks gestation, uh, at least initially. Although ultimately, and this is the ultimate avoidance of, of uh, positive pressure ventilation, many of those babies ultimately do end up uh, being intubated. So it is inevitable that in some of the more immature babies, we will have to intubate and subject them to mechanical ventilation, which we know is potentially injurious. So we have to choose some settings. And the first choice we need to make is what form of um, synchronized ventilation we should use. And we need to keep in mind that with synchronized ventilation, the tidal volume that results is the sum of the uh, positive pressure from the ventilator shown in green here. Uh, and the negative inspiratory effort of the infant, which is not seen on the ventilator waveform interface. It, it is not measured um, in the pulmonary graphics, but it is there. And uh, babies uh, who are premature, as you know, have irregular respiratory effort, sometimes apnea, sometimes periodic breathing. So it makes it uh, more challenging uh, and they don't have a lot of um, strength so they often breathing through narrow endotracheal tubes don't generate a very strong, um, a very large tidal volume. And so if you were to use SIMV by itself, um, you would have the following problem. And what I've done here, here are the positive pressure inflations and here in red below the line is a negative inspiratory effort of the baby. So synchronized, so this tidal volume is going to be quite large because it's the ventilator and the baby working together but in between the baby's breathing spontaneously. And if you're not using pressure support, the tidal volume often is insufficient to even uh, clear the anatomical dead space. And this is essentially rebreathing dead space does not contribute very much to um, minute ventilation. So this is probably not the way to ventilate babies. I favor, personally, I favor assist control of pressure support as a primary mode. But if you were to use um, SIMB, uh, you would at least want to use it with some pressure support. <clears throat> and this is shown here. Again, very much the same breathing pattern of the infant, uh, but now we have added, apologies, this is jumping on me. Now we have added uh, some positive pressure, pressure support, so that the tidal volumes become more adequate and easily clear dead space. So it's important to recognize that breathing through a narrow endotracheal tube really handicaps our extremely small infants. And because uh, without adequate pressure support, um, there are only a relatively sm a small number of positive pressure inflations, the tidal volume with the SIMV ends up being larger and more injurious uh, than with assist control. And that's been pretty well documented. Uh, how much pressure support to use? Uh, well, the point is to get adequate tidal volume. So it should be titrated. It shouldn't always be six as some people do. You, six may be a reasonable starting point, but then you have to look at what tidal volume you're achieving with that pressure support. And if it's still not uh, at least three and a half to four ml per kilo, then you need to increase your pressure support. Of course, uh, I have for a number of years advocated volume targeted ventilation as an important um, uh, lung protective strategy. Uh, and I will uh, show you some evidence that it's excessive tidal volume rather than pressure that matters most in terms of lung injury. You know that uh, hyperventilation occurs frequently and is not easily avoided with pressure control ventilation. And we know that that's not good for the brain and the lungs. And you also may be aware that the uh, traditional adult type of volume controlled ventilation doesn't work very well well in newborn infants for reasons I'll briefly explain. So here are, is one of many studies that have looked at this issue and what, it, uh, what they did in this study is they took a bunch of small animals, uh, uh, and they uh, uh, exposed them to progressively higher inflation pressures. These animals had healthy lungs. Uh, and in half of the animals here in the, in the uh, filled bars, the black bars, um, those animals had a tight plaster cast placed around the chest and abdomen to restrain chest wall movement and therefore limit tidal volume. And they look at uh, capillary filtration coefficient, essentially an index of acute lung injury or lung edema. And at 15 centimeters of water, not much happened. It's a low pressure, doesn't like, overexpand the lungs, doesn't injure anything. At 30 centimeters of water, there was already a significant increase after a rather brief period of mechanical ventilation. 
where the lungs were free to move, no, diff no change um, when uh, the plaster cast limited tidal volume. It's not surprising that in these animals with normal uh, lung compliance, a pressure of 45 resulted in a vast increase in lung edema. What is surprising is that uh, the animals in whom um, tidal volume was constrained did not show any such increase, uh, suggesting clearly that it is excessive tidal volume, not the pressure by itself, uh, that causes uh, the acute lung injury. And so uh, this and many other studies essentially tell us that the ad uh, adverse consequences of inflation pressure, of high inflation pressure, are mediated through excessive tidal volume. And if the pressure does not result in an uh, over in distension of the lungs, you do not see that um, injury. So because we were in historically very concerned about uh, the effects of pressure and because we, we use uncuffed endotracheal tubes uh, and because when we initially tried volume control ventilation with adult machines in the 1980s, it didn't work very well. We all defaulted to uh, pressure controlled positive pressure ventilation, which in its basic functionality is nothing more than a mechanical T-piece resuscitator, which we're all familiar with. And so if you're in an SIMV mode during the expiratory phase, there is continuous flow of gas through the circuit. There's a peep valve maintaining distending pressure and um, the patient can breathe in and out um, uh, spontaneously. And when the ventilator cycles on, the expiratory valve closes, the circuit's pressurized and gas enters the lungs in proportion to the pressure in the circuit and the compliance of the lungs. And we're not worried about leak around the endotracheal tube because there's plenty of fresh gas to compensate and maintain the desired uh, lung inflation. So this is easy to use. Uh, and we felt uh, that it was really important to control the pressure. Uh, barophobia uh, has persisted to this day, but it's probably uh, misguided. The problem with uh, pressure control ventilation, of course, is that compliance can improve rapidly. Uh, when babies first come out, there's a lot of fluid in the lungs. They may not have established adequate FRC. They have not yet received their surfactant. Then all of that changes. We have a rather effective animal-derived surfactants uh, that rapidly improve compliance. Baby clears their lung. We apply adequate distending pressure. And all of a sudden, the baby moves from this flat portion of the compliance curve where whatever pressure we were using may have been just about right. And then suddenly, that same um, positive pressure results in a much larger tidal volume. Uh, and this can be uh, quite injurious. <clears throat> so we don't have a single large randomized trial, but we do have a series of um, uh, smaller studies that amount to a total of almost 1,000 infants studied. And um, this latest meta-analysis demonstrated a strong trend, but not quite significant in the combined outcome of death or BPD at 36 weeks. Um, the point estimate was 25% uh, reduction, but the confidence intervals cross one, so not a significant difference. But BPD as the primary outcome was reduced by 27%. And um, the confidence intervals now are clearly to the left of the line of unity. They do not cross one. And a rather impressive number needed to treat of only eight. Uh, so this is uh, the, uh, nothing else um, uh, makes this much of an impact on chronic lung disease, to my knowledge. Severe uh, interventricular hemorrhage and interventricular hemorrhage plus or minus PVL were reduced by about 50%, uh, again, statistically significant, was a number needed to treat of 11. Pneumothorax was reduced by about 50%, less common events, so number needed to treat is a little higher. Hypocapnia was reduced by about 50%, uh, and because it is a common event, only three babies need to be treated to avoid one instance of significant uh, hypocapnia. And duration of mechanical ventilation was reduced by uh, a little more than a day. So these are all pretty impressive uh, outcomes suggesting that we really should be doing this. So I just want to point out the difference between volume control ventilation and volume targeted ventilation. Volume control ventilation is the adult style of ventilation uh, where a fixed uh, tidal volume is injected into the proximal end of the ventilator circuit. This is um, 
In other words, volume control ventilation controls what enters the patient's circuit. It does not control what enters the patient's lungs. That's an important distinction. In larger subjects without an endotracheal tube leak, this works just fine um, because the lungs are large and more compliant than the circuit. But when you have a tiny baby attached here uh, and when you have an uncuffed endotracheal tube, there's a lot of loss of volume uh, to the to compression of gas within the circuit, leak around the endotracheal tube, so that you may have to set a tidal volume of 10 or 12 ml in order to uh, achieve an act effective tidal volume entering the lungs of around 4 ml. This, of course, is variable. It's not a constant relationship. And leakage is, of course, also highly variable. So this did not work very well. And um, that was the main reason why we all reverted to pressure control ventilation. But now we have a more sophisticated approach, which um, is uh, what I refer to as volume targeted ventilation. There's some confusion in the literature. Some people re uh, refer to volume targeted ventilation as anything that pays attention to tidal volume. But the way I use it is pressure control ventilation is automatic adjustment of inflation pressure. So it's still pressure controlled, but instead of manual adjustment to the inflation pressure, we make those, then we let the um, ventilator make those adjustments automatically and in real time. So after initial inflation or two, the tidal volume is measured, it's compared to the target. And if, it's, if the uh, tidal volume measured is less than target, inflation pressure will go up for the next cycle. If it's within a few percent of the target tidal volume, no change. And if it's above the target, the inflation pressure will be reduced for the subsequent title, uh, cycle. <clears throat> and we have uh, some pretty good evidence, as I showed you, uh, that this is beneficial. And it's been shown, uh, among other things, by us and others, that you maintain a relatively constant tidal volume. There is some fluctuation because the baby's contribution to the transpulmonary pressure uh, is variable. It's a good thing because completely monotonous tidal volume leads to atelectasis. But the important, most important thing is prevention of overdistension of volutrauma and hypocapnia when we do the things we do to help the baby improve their lung uh, compliance, which can happen very soon, very rapidly soon after birth or after initiation of mechanical ventilation and administration of surfactant. Equally important is the fact that um, the ventilator lowers uh, or adjusts inflation pressure in real time. It doesn't wait for the next blood gas. It doesn't wait for morning rounds. It doesn't worry that the professor will uh, chastise it for making the wrong decision. It does what it's programmed to do and leads to more rapid weaning from mechanical ventilation. And finally, it also compensates for the highly variable respiratory drive of any mature infant um, who has a lot of periodic breathing and brief periods of apnea and volume targeted ventilation. It will make that adjustment uh, in real time. <clears throat> So that's one half of the equation, but the other important element of, volume, uh, of uh, lung protective um, support is to make sure that that tidal volume, which we so carefully control, is evenly distributed into a well aerated open lung. And uh, that may be a confusing statement, so let me clarify. We think of RDS as a homogeneous disease and on a plain chest X-ray, it looks rather homogeneous. But that's because a three-dimensional structure is being compressed into two dimensions. And if you cut the lungs crosswise with a CT scan or MRI, or these days with electrical impedance tomography, you will see that much of the atelectasis is concentrated posteriorly in the dependent portion of the lung. And the aerated lung uh, is in the non-dependent portion of the lung. And when you ventilate a lung that looks like this, you of course will have a relatively high oxygen requirement due to ventilation perfusion matching. And that's in, in itself is toxic, but there's a, a, a complex process of atelect trauma uh, going on with surfactant inactivation, increased surfactant turnover in the alectatic portion of the lung with shear forces causing acute uh, mechanical injury at the boundary uh, with uh, portions of the lung that are expanding within each inflation and collapsing at end exhalation, which we know is very uh, injur injurious. And finally, we have the aerated portion of the lung, which it turns out receives the bulk of each tidal volume. Why? It is because, as you recall, Laplace's law tells us that the pressure needed to distend 
a balloon or alveolus is inversely proportional to the radius. So the critical opening pressure of these collapsed alveoli is higher than the pressure needed to overexpand the already aerated larger um, air sacs. And consequently, uh, this uh, relatively healthy uh, non-dependent portion of the lung is where most of the lung injury will, will occur with volume trauma uh, regionally um, focused over here. And we actually have experimental evidence to tell us that this is in fact true. Uh, this is again, not new data. Uh, here, the investigators um, lavaged some uh, animals and used uh, what they described as non-injurious uh, ventilation, which was um, an open lung strategy. Uh, so they, they avoided that problem. And uh, Injurious ventilation was where they did not recruit the lung adequately. So the situation that I just described and what they saw looking at hyaline membrane score and, uh, and, and, and histologic uh, measures of lung injury, the non-dependent uh, region of the lung is where most of the lung injury was. Again, here as well, when you look at uh, biochemical uh, markers of lung injury, cytokines, etc. again, most of the injury was in the non-dependent regions of the lung. So this is a real phenomenon and we need to do something to correct the problem. Uh, if we're starting over here with poorly aerated lungs um, on the pressure volume loop uh, or relationship, uh, we're here on the inspiratory limb, uh, the aeration is poor, compliance is poor, indicated by the relatively flat slope of this compliance curve and of course, high oxygen requirement. And the trick is to increase our mean airway pressure. With oscillatory ventilation, it's easy to do by directly increasing mean airway pressure with conventional ventilation. It's essentially occurring by increasing end expiratory pressure along with some increase in BIP. In inflation pressure it does need to reach the critical opening pressure at least briefly, and then end expiratory pressure maintains it. And the idea is to move up um, to full lung inflation, and there will be some overexpansion of the lung when we reach uh, this full um, open lung. Uh, and now we are in a situation where having in inflated the lung, it becomes more compliant. Recall again Laplace's law. So these alveoli now need less pressure than they did when they were collapsed. And the idea is to reduce the distending pressure uh, and find the sweet spot just uh, above the de-recruitment uh, uh, point over here. And now we have a relatively nicely inflated uh, lung. We can now actually see this in real time with electrical impedance tomography, which is still a research tool, not readily available at the bedside for most of us, but uh, you can really see uh, that this phenomenon is occurring. And this hysteresis of the pressure volume relationship is, is, is very, much, very key. And, and we like to ventilate on the expiratory limb of the pressure volume relationship over here. So alveolar stability is a real uh, issue. The, uh, the collapse and re-expansion of, uh, of alveoli is very injurious. The healthy lung does not have such a problem. The alveoli are stable. When the lung is injured and surfactant deficient, <clears throat> uh, the problem is alveoli collapse. Um, one way to avoid that is high frequency uh, ventilation. Uh, oscillatory ventilation avoids uh, spending any uh, amount of time at the and expiratory uh, pressure. Um, and um, it's been shown to maintain alveolar stability as seen here. But it turns out that you don't need to, uh, that, that it's not, the, the benefit is not limited to, um, to oscillatory ventilation. Uh, the benefit uh, can also be achieved by using adequate end expiratory pressure. So PEEP is very much protective, PEEP, adequate PEEP, uh, with adequate uh, lung recruitment, maintains lung volume and avoids that atelect trauma we talked about here is a very old study that shows that when ventilating, even for a relatively a brief period of a couple of hours with no PEEP, uh, this is just looking at pressure volume loops after period of ventilation, the, this loop is clearly abnormal. Four centimeters of PEEP may be not quite as bad, but still bad. Uh, with sufficiently high PEEP, in this case, um, they, they defined it as being above the lower inflection point. Uh, clearly, PEEP was protective. And there's many, many other examples of that. Uh, that don't, I don't have time to show you that. 
Uh, and here is uh, evidence that uh, lung protective ventilation uh, is possible even with conventional ventilation. So here is a group of animals ventilated uh, after being lavaged uh, with warm saline to remove surfactant, ventilated conventionally with large tidal volume uh, and low end expiratory pressure, very high lung injury score. With oscillatory ventilation using the open lung strategy, a great reduction in that acute lung injury score. But here is a group of animals ventilated at conventional rates with uh, adequate end expiratory pressure and showing similar degree of protection. So end expiratory pressure is important in maintaining uh, alveolar stability and avoiding lung injury. But there's no simple recipe for PEEP because there is no single level of PEEP that's optimal for all infants or even for one individual infant at all points in time. It's a dynamic scenario. The idea is to, of course, is to uh, titrate PEEP to optimize lung volume. We do not paralyze our babies. So they breathe and they take spontaneous large uh, recruiting size on their own. So for most babies who are uh, awake and breathing, uh, PEEP is what's needed to, um, to facilitate uh, lung volume recruitment. And because we don't all have access to uh, uh, EIT, we use oxygen requirement as a proxy for ventilation perfusion matching, which is of course a proxy for uh, optimal lung inflation. Uh, so the idea, if you have acute RDS, we titrate the PEEP up until the FiO2 comes down, typically down to less than uh, 30%. Um, once the, once the um, FiO2 is, is down, we need to again recognize that the lung now has become more compliant. If we have just given surfactant, the lung becomes more compliant. So it's equally important to come down on the PEEP once the lung becomes well recruited um, because excessive PEEP can be damaging, but not enough PEEP is equally uh, harmful. So we need to um, be uh, vigilant and maintain uh, the appropriate level of PEEP for an individual patient at any given point in time to be truly lung protective. Of course, the exception to the sort of uh, usual levels of end expiratory pressure, which range from uh, four to maybe eight, sometimes a little bit higher. Older infants with BPD need much higher end expiratory pressure for different reasons that we don't have time to go into. And so, um, Let's briefly talk about uh, how we um, should initiate mechanical ventilation. Um, so you have read all the books, you have listened to all the lectures, so you understand that you need to tailor your strategy based on the pathophysiology of your patient. You choose the settings you believe are correct for your patient. And typically in many, uh, for many people, this is, this is the end of it and then they get a blood gas, forgetting this really important step which is to evaluate the patient's clinical response because they're not all the same. And uh, the, all the target uh, tidal volumes described in the literature, they have a standard deviation around them. Um, one size does not fit all. So we need to look at the patient and then blood gas only confirms uh, what the baby was telling us and, the, and that the adjustments we made in, in response to the baby's uh, uh, clues uh, are appropriate. And so what are those? Um, so babies can tell us a lot uh, if we understand their language. So if, for example, initiated mechanical ventilation, maybe you just gave some surfactant uh, and the baby who is breathing actively uh, stops breathing after 10 or 15 minutes, that probably suggests that we have taken away their respiratory drive uh, and um, you need to make an adjustment to the target tidal volume or if you're on a different modality, perhaps the rate. If the baby becomes tachypneic or remains tachypneic with retractions, the baby is clearly telling us that the support is inadequate and we need to uh, respond to that, not wait for a blood gas. You should be able to tell clinically if the baby is not receiving adequate support. Uh, if the baby's oxygen requirement is rising, we probably have a problem with insufficient mean airway pressure uh, and, and diffuse microatlectasis. So uh, we need to uh, adjust the PEEP. And my favorite, babies fighting the ventilator. And some people say, oh, the blood gas is bad because the baby is fighting the ventilator, so let's paralyze him or give him some morphine. Actually, the baby who's fighting the ventilator is struggling for breath. They're air hungry. They're telling us something. And um, they can't tell us exactly what's wrong, but 
uh, it's either grossly inadequate support, perhaps it's an obstructed endotracheal tube, maybe the tube is uh, down in the right mainstem bronchus, uh, the baby's head is turned and up against the wall of the trachea, something is seriously wrong, and we need to figure out what it is, look at the waveforms, look at the baby, and uh, correct that. Drugs only mask the baby's response to inadequate support. They don't correct the problem. And finally, what about high frequency ventilation? Um, I will go through this quickly. Um, as you know, early studies of high frequency did show benefit over simple primitive and intermittent mandatory ventilation with no synchrony and no uh, effort to optimize lung inflation. But high frequency ventilation remained relatively stagnant. We early on grasped the importance of uh, the open lung strategy with high frequency ventilation, but conventional ventilation uh, in the meantime advanced with the development of synchronized ventilation, volume targeted ventilation, um, uh, waveforms, um, the importance of open lung strategy with conventional ventilation was recognized. And so more recent studies no longer showed clear benefits and uh, efforts to do individual patient level meta-analyses did not identify any subgroups that clearly show um, uh, advantages of high frequency ventilation. Yet in very experienced hands, it works well and they are centers that use high frequency ventilation as the primary mode of support. But the risk of hypocapnia has tr clearly been an impediment to widespread acceptance, including my own. I don't use high frequency as a primary mode because I'm not always um, at the bedside. And it's really easy to overventilate because as you know, tidal volume, uh, the CO2 elimination is related to uh, tidal volume squared. So even small increases in tidal volume can, um, can really lead to overventilation. So for that reason, high frequency has remained largely a rescue technique, but this may change. Uh, because we now have some newer technologies. Uh, everybody's familiar probably with the Sensomatics 3100, which is an antique device introduced in the 1980s. It's noisy. It doesn't do anything but high frequency and it can't measure anything. The machine doesn't know if there's a cork at the end of the circuit or a patient. So um, that's a problem. But we do have other devices. This is one of them, but there are other high frequency ventilators that have these capabilities that can generate, that can do both conventional and high frequency. Um, they use a conventional ventilator circuit, a stiff one, but, but more easily managed. Uh, they're quieter and they can measure things. And with the Drager oscillator and a few others, uh, you can measure. Uh, you can maintain uh, not only measure tidal volume, but you can use volume guarantee, which is really, uh, for me, a, a, a game-changing uh, innovation. It's been available in the rest of the world for some time, but it's still not approved by our Food and Drug Administration, um, it is, that's, which is rather unfortunate. Um, volume targeted ventilation with high frequencies, analogous to conventional. Tidal volume is measured, averaged over a few cycles because of the high frequency. This compared to the target and the amplitude, the pressure amplitude is adjusted to keep at target tidal volume. Then you of course have to set a limit just like with conventional volume uh, uh, targeted ventilation. And uh, of course the mean airway pressure is still manually controlled. So um, in order to hopefully get the uh, FDA to approve the study, we conducted a large uh, multi-center trial a couple of years ago in order to um, have this device now be able to do high frequency even in the United States. And it was a study that used a historical cohort comparison um, for a variety of reasons. And um, these were prospectively collected. Um, and what you can see is uh, that, you know, the outcomes were uh, quite favorable. Uh, we were not seeking to show that the um, device was better. We, it was a non-inferiority trial, but all these uh, important outcomes favored um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the new device. It maintained very stable CO2 over the first 48 hours and beyond. Uh, we used a frequency of 10 Hertz. Uh, perhaps today I would have used 15. So the total volume we used was a little bit over two initially and came down to around two ml per kilo. That's um, consistent with what's been observed uh, otherwise. And importantly, it worked remarkably well. Uh, we looked at uh, thousands of, uh, of cycles and um, 
93% of the time in the, in the raw data, uh, the measured tidal volume was within 0.1 ml of target. 6.4% uh, of the time it was, whoops, I'm sorry, uh, it was a little bit above target, uh, below target. And the reason for that in a significant number was that the uh, clinicians um, failed to adjust the uh, amplitude limit. So the machine couldn't do what it was trying to do when we eliminated the user error related uh, tidal volumes, it was uh, the, uh, the percentage went up to 96%. So it really works incredibly well. So to summarize, prevention of lung injury begins in the delivery room with careful stabilization, uh, use of CPAP and avoidance of excessively large uh, tidal inflations. Non-invasive support is the best way to avoid lung injury. Uh, vo avoiding volume trauma is best done with volume targeted ventilation with different kinds, but volume guarantee is the prototype and most widely studied. Ensuring optimal lung inflation, the open lung concept is critical in um, reducing lung injury. And again, one size does, does not fit all and you need to do individualized patient care following important principles. And hopefully better devices are coming uh, to our NICUs even here in the United States, hopefully. And that's what I have for you. Thank you very much for your attention. This is what you do when your funding runs out. Um, and if you want to read more about it, this is the textbook that um, uh, describes a lot of this in far more detail than I can in 30 minutes. So that is all I have. And uh, if we have time for a few questions, I'll be happy to field those questions. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. It was uh, quite enlightening about uh, the lung, pro lung protective strategies in the conventional and the high frequency ventilation. I'd, I'd like to ask the audience, how many of you have the ventilators with the volume guarantee? Can you raise hands? I think it's quite a bit. So, but uh, there must be so many places where uh, these uh, volume gar guarantee ventilators are not available. But I think uh, it has been quite nicely uh, shown that it, there is a lot of evidence that the volume guarantee actually helps in decreasing the incidence of the B incidence of the BPD and many other uh, mor morbidities. Uh, Professor Martin, can you tell us about uh, how do we um, um, in in the day the very room? How do we control the volume? If we have to intubate and ventilate, is there any way where we can? Because they say that. Uh, even four to five breaths, invasive breaths, which are not controlled, can cause a lung injury. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we know that the self-inflating bag tends to generate excessive um, peak pressures and therefore tidal volume. So uh, using the T-piece resuscitator is uh, one way to minimize lung injury. Uh, it's also been shown that relying on visual inspection of chest rise is not terribly reliable in terms of uh, achieving uh, or accurately estimating the, the tidal volume. So there is actually a, a small company that's um, been trying to develop, has developed a prototype of volume uh, targeted resuscitator uh, called the next step. Um, it is not commercially available yet. It is being studied uh, and um, seems to be performing as, as, as hoped for, because of course we um, don't typically uh, have the ability to, to measure tidal volume uh, immediately in the delivery room. There are, uh, there are means of doing that in, uh, and, and you certainly can put in a flow sensor in line with your, with your T-piece resuscitator and measure tidal volume and, and monitor it and, and make adjustments uh, in, your, in your pressure, but this device would do it automatically. And I think that's the next, um, uh, indeed, the next step in, in the delivery room care where we can uh, try to avoid that because compliance changes quite rapidly uh, in the process of initial stabilization. As you know, once you, uh, the, the initial first breaths may require fairly high pressure and very quickly after that, it needs to be reduced. So, um, so that's, uh, that's important. There is a, there's a study 
being, I think, proposed at this point um, that um, seeks to um, uh, demonstrate that immediately after intubation, um, employing volume targeted ventilation in the delivery room using a standard neonatal ventilator um, might be beneficial rather than continuing to use the TPs uh, during you know, the initial stabilization. So there are, there are some approaches, but they're not, they're not easy to do. If this device, uh, the next step becomes commercially available, I think it would be a, a real um, game changer in terms of um, making it a lot easier to, uh, uh, to avoid the problem. Of course, we have to deal with, initially, most babies are not intubated and positive pressure is being delivered by a face mask <clears throat> and leaks around the face mask. The, you know, the technique um, of the resuscitator uh, needs to be meticulous. And again, there is evidence that giving, um, using a, a physiologic monitor during resuscitation improves um, performance by uh, allowing the clinician to recognize quickly uh, that they have inadequate seal and correct that. And, and that, so those are, there, there's a lot, of go, a lot of going on in the delivery room resuscitation uh, uh, area in terms of research. Um, our uh, Australian colleagues have done a lot of that work and, um, and there's more to come. That's a whole other lecture. I had only 30 minutes to cover everything, so <laughs> couldn't get into enough detail. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, can we just ask you one more question? What is the maximum PEEP which we can go uh, towards uh, when uh, trying to you know open the lung? And also, can we use an X-ray chest? to assess the lung volume and to see where exactly the lung volume is, but that has actually opened up or not? Yeah, that, that's, those are important questions. And, um, you know, the chest x-ray is not the best tool. It's, um, it's a tool. It's best we have most of the time um, in, in terms of um, assessing visually the, the lung volume. But technique is important. If it's not centered well, if it's centered over the belly button rather than over the chest, the, the dome of the diaphragm projects differently. So rib counts uh, only take us so far. Uh, you need to also look at the lung parenchyma in terms of uh, is, it, is it well aerated or, or not so much. So it's not just diaphragm position, but uh, for most of us, that's the best we have. Um, the electrical impedance tomography is a tool that's hopefully going to become more available. Uh, in the reasonably near future. As to how high a PEEP, um, so most of the time you don't need to go extremely high uh, because uh, surfactants work and, and improve compliance. And again, it depends on the scenario. So if we're talking about uh, initial stabilization of a preterm infant, um, usually um, we don't need to go certainly higher than eight occasionally. I have gone up as high as 10 uh, on rare occasions. If you give surfactant early, if you give surfactant essentially immediately after intubation, uh, then you will rarely need to do a lot of aggressive lung volume recruitment because um, the animal derived surfactants we now have available uh, really improve compliance uh, and aeration pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, you know, in some scenarios, you know, babies intubated in the delivery suite and then moved to the NICU and the um, surfactants only administered maybe 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, which is probably still reasonable. But in the meantime, then you probably do need to use uh, a higher level of end expiratory pressure. Um, there is a study currently uh, underway or having just started um, the polar trial that is looking at dynamic PEEP. So having shown that uh, the sustained inflation approach uh, was uh, not the best way, and based on some animal data, um, uh, David Tingay um, designed this polar trial. Several of us uh, uh, here were also involved with that. And, um, and the concept is to titrate the PEEP upward in, uh, during the initial stabilization. So not necessarily intubated, but rather CPAP uh, approach. And um, so the control arm is going to be static PEEP of whatever people choose to use five or six uh, as a starting point. And the uh, intervention arm is going to look at uh, escalating the PEEP stepwise until oxygenation improves. And so in that scenario, you might easily go up to eight or even 10 centimeters. Again, briefly, the key is not to 
I think where we fall down and where we, um, uh, many people have had some bad experiences and some studies show um, uh, potential harms of, of, of high index battery pressure is because it remains high, okay? And, and again, once the lungs are recruited, once the alveolar diameter increases, what was necessary to open them up becomes excessive. So it's easy to show bad effects of high PEEP if you don't back off once the higher PEEP achieved its intended goal, which is to open up the alveoli. Right. So you may briefly need to go up to eight or 10, uh, but then quickly back off once oxygenation improves and lung aeration improves. That's the key. So is that the way we bring the uh, ventilation towards the uh, expiratory part of the hysteresis? So you have shown uh, that um, uh, we have to, for optimal ventilation, it is good to ventilate in the expiratory curve of the PV loop. So uh, we should first increase the PEEP and then gradually come down based on the oxygenation. Exactly. So the, uh, the um, Dutch uh, investigators uh, did a nice uh, study a few years ago using oscillatory ventilation where they demonstrated this um, uh, stepwise increase is the oscillator uh, directly mean airway pressure. And they do this recruitment maneuver before giving surfactant, arguing that surfactant distribution is improved if you put surfactant into a, a recruited lung, which is, which is true based on experimental data. So um, they start at a lower distending pressure, uh, typically around eight or uh, 10 centimeters, and then they progressively increase uh, in two centimeter of mean airway pressure increments every two or three minutes as long as oxygenation continues to improve. When they uh, are able to wean the FiO2 down to less than 25, uh, less than 25%, in their case, most of us are happy with less than 30%, um, they consider the lung fully recruited. And at that point, they, they consider that the quote unquote open lung, and then they decrease the distending pressure in two centimeter increments or decrements rather, uh, until just and they just begin to see a deterioration in oxygenation and they call that the closing pressure and ultimately they then go up back up two centimeters and uh, and they're happy that that is the appropriate uh, distending pressure at that time now um, it takes some period of time to, to achieve that and then they give this effect and so most of us don't do it this way most of us give this effect and uh, right away so um, but, but, but they illustrate very nicely the concept and where they end up. So uh, just to give you the numbers, the mean airway pressure in these surfactant deficient uh, babies um, at maximum pressure, the open lung uh, was about 20 centimeters mean airway pressure. And then the closing, um, the pressure, pressure was about, um, uh, 11, uh, about 10 or 11, 10 to 12, somewhere in that region. Um, so much lower, right? You end up at a much lower pressure than you initially went up to, illustrating the concept that once uh, the lungs open, it requires much less pressure to maintain uh, the lung volume. And that's, that's where you're sliding down the expiratory limb, finding the spot just above the closing pressure. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, one last question. Do you use ultrasound to uh, help in the lung recruitment, what's your opinion about it? So lung ultrasound is really something that's coming, uh, coming along and becoming um, more widely accepted. It was initially misunderstood um, uh, and uh, many people were like ultrasound of the lung air doesn't conduct ultrasound. What are you talking about? Um, but now I think we have pretty strong evidence that it can be useful. We have not um, done much of it in the United States because of some logistical and territorial and, and um, um, medical legal concerns. Uh, but from what I understand, and so um, Daniel DeLuca and, and uh, Francesco Raimondi have done a lot of work in, in that area. And it seems to be a useful tool, um, but I don't have personal experience with it. But I think we will be, um, or much, many of us will start using it in the, in the near future to help uh, understand this, this state of inflation, uh, state of aeration of the lung. It's true. 
thank you sir thank you dr martin for a wonderful talk which was very enlightening thank you so much thank you professor martin kessler for giving valuable insights on the topic we would also like to extend our gratitude to the moderator of the session dr ravi shankar thank you sir